Hi, welcome to Woodland Park Zoo's One Wild World, examining the intersection of animals, humans, and habitats in a global pandemic. This three-part series is possible thanks to financial support from U.S. Fish and Wildlife and is brought to you live from this studio in Seattle thanks to Seattle Lives and PNTA. I'm Farah Paul, Director of Public Relations and Community Affairs at Woodland Park Zoo, and I'll be your moderator for today's event called One Northwest, Species and Spaces of the Pacific Northwest. Last week, we explored the topic of animals and human care and the role of zoos. That episode is now available to watch at zoo.org forward slash one wild world. We have another amazing lineup of guests this week, including our wonderful panel who will be joining us in the studio. We'll be socially distancing and wearing our masks when we can to make sure that we're keeping each other safe. We also have some incredible live and pre-recorded guests that will be joining us throughout the hour. Before we get started, I'd like to ask all of you a question for our live poll. Please open your live chat and type in your response. Here's the question. When you think about the Pacific Northwest, what pressure on our ecosystem worries you most? I'll read that one more time. When you think about the Pacific Northwest, what's the pressure on our ecosystem that worries you most? Type one for the health of our water, type two for the climate crisis, type three for wildfires, or type four for threats to endangered species. I'll give you a minute to respond and we'll check those results shortly. If you're just joining us, welcome to episode two of the One Wild World series. Today we're featuring One Northwest, the species and spaces of the Pacific Northwest. We have a very special guest on the line to help us kick off this conversation. The Honorable Sally Jewell served as US Secretary of the Interior from 2013 to 2017. Among many other accomplishments, she served as the president and CEO of REI and filled numerous governance and board leadership roles, including with the Nature Conservancy and as a regent at our neighboring University of Washington and a distinguished fellow in their College of the Environment. Secretary Jewell, thank you so much for being here with us. I think you might be on mute. Can you uh, check your mic? I'm off mute. There you go. We can, can hear you great. Me? We can hear you now. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks for being here. Um, we're going to be talking a lot today about wildlife and wild spaces. Can you help us start that conversation by talking about the importance of protecting open spaces and wildlife corridors? You know, we live in a place that has been growing and is fragmented. And it's up to all of us to protect these spaces over the long term. So one of the most important things I would say about protecting open spaces and wildlife corridors is illustrated in along the I-90 corridor, which is the Mountain Sound Greenway. So um, I, I've given you a few pictures. I'm wondering if we might uh, show some of those pictures from the Washington State Department of Transportation. Do you have those handy, yeah. uh, Farah? There we go. There we go. So this is an illustration of uh, something that the Washington State Department of Transportation did because of advocacy and working alongside the Mountains to Sound Greenway. Um, I've been involved with that organization since it was founded in 1991 and got a chance to work with a civic leader, Jim Ellis, in that. And those pictures you just saw were pictures of um, wildlife crossings as we have so many animals that are killed and slaughtered on I-90. Um, you need space for ungulate species to be able to migrate. You need um, spaces where mountain lions, cougars, can go back and forth. We have species like lynx that are in our forests, and yet they need genetic diversity and they need to be able to move. When we bisect with human development, it impedes that. And I use the Greenway as an example because uh, it's been over 30 years in the making, and it's recognizing that without having um, an understanding of what's there, our wildlife corridors get nibbled away by development. But if we do work together, we could do some pretty spectacular things. So Doug McDonald was secretary of the Washington State Department of Transportation. He advocated for this. It was federal money where now as you go across Ketchelis Lake, you will be on a bridge so wildlife can migrate underneath. When you uh, continue along I-90, you'll see those crossings. And that's a good illustration of the things that we can do and why it is so important to think about wildlife corridors and connectivity so that we do have these animals in the wild and not just able to see them in the zoos. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for all the work you've done to help create these wildlife corridors and open spaces. I know that you've been an advocate for connecting people to nature, especially youth. Why do you feel it's so important for people to go outside? You know, I grew up in this area with deep connections to nature. And I recognize that it shaped me as an individual. And it made me, uh, made me understand how I fit into a broader world, which is something that our indigenous communities know so well. All children deserve to have that kind of background, and yet they don't in a world where we are getting less connected. The picture you see right now is also from the Mount Sound Greenway. And these are young kids who are taking seedlings and plat planting them in pails out by Lake Sammamish State Park so that older youth can go in and re-green the hillsides that have been impacted by prior logging activities, logging roads, um, and other forms of destruction. These children will never forget this experience. They will never forget that place. And having opportunities for youth to connect in nature, uh, to understand how they can be part of a solution, to explore what's what's around them in the tide pools or the wilderness or you know along our corridors is really, really important. So I just encourage all of you, you drive along I-90, look for the thin green lines on those mountain sides in front of you and those are old logging roads that have been replanted with plants like these kids repotted that have reclaimed our hillsides and uh, improved that habitat. That's incredible, thank you. Well, if there's one thing this pandemic has shown us, it's that we're all connected. And as you're thinking about our connected world, what would you say is the biggest threat that we collectively face? I think the biggest threat is climate change and human activities that have caused climate change. I think there is no question that when you look at, you know, the little things that add up, like uh, wildfires, like ocean acidification, um, like agricultural runoff and all these things that impact our environment, they are tied into human activities and climate change. So the picture you see is of a young person bird banding up in the Arctic. Um, many species migrate thousands of miles and they depend on critical habitat which has been challenged by climate change. It's another picture you might put up of the Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge, which is a critical habitat that has been set aside since the 1940s uh, for protection so that these uh, birds and endangered species like the Pacific Black Brant have a place to go. Much harder to find places at a time of climate change. This landscape that you look at is threatened by development. Um, I held firm uh, under tremendous pressure to punch a road through this little isthmus of land that is critical to these species, which would impact uh, the ability of these species to migrate, which is challenged by climate change. So that, you know, human activities and climate change, uh, you know, are together. I'd also ask if you can play a little video that I provided, and this is a picture that I shot on the north slope of Alaska in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And it's a group of polar bears um, that I observed from the airport in Kaktovik. That airport is being eroded as um, the pack ice moves out and the shores get battered. And these polar bears have limited places to go. They're beginning to um, interbreed with grizzly bears, creating a kind of a new subspecies called pizzlies. That's the, the common name. They are in trouble. And where I counted 29 individuals, I didn't see any young ones because they are uh, in deep trouble because of climate change. Um, George Bush administration uh, protected these species because of climate change. Just a couple of other pictures. Um, I, uh, I took this one of coastal erosion on the North Slope and this just shows permafrost, and it also shows the battering of these landscapes as they are eroding quickly. In some cases, um, you know, 60 feet of coastline encroaching, um, undermining native villages that have been there since time immemorial. Uh, these are the kinds of things that climate change is doing, and of course, um, we find it here in the Pacific Northwest as well. Uh, 
we have coastal erosion, we have um, human development that has impacted um, the uh, feeder bluffs that are critical to our, our coastal habitat. We have wildfires and longer, hotter, more destructive mm -hmm. fire seasons and more dramatic droughts and, and um, uh, rainfall. And of course, um, generally here we love the going outdoors, but uh, smoke has prevented us from doing that safely over the course of the summer. And that's also tied into to climate change. So um, our region is at risk, maybe not as dramatically as the Ar uh, Arctic, but it's at risk due to our own behaviors and due to climate change. So uh, it's up to us to do something about that. Thanks, Secretary Julen. You know, at least for me, this topic of climate change can feel really huge and overwhelming. And as you just said, it's up to us to do something about it. So what advice would you have for someone who's watching and wondering, like, if I'm just one person, what can I do to help? You can advocate for things that align the interests of people with the interests of environment. So what does that look like? Um, it means smart, thoughtful regulations that reward us, for example, for composting our waste as opposed to dumping it in a landfill, that reward us for burning less fossil fuels, uh, for driving more energy efficient vehicles, for taking public transit, um, for being more energy efficient in our homes. Um, we can take action through the people that we elect. We have an election coming up, we're all aware of that. We wish it was over, it's, go it's going very slowly <laughs> for most people for a variety of reasons, but the fact is that policies that we make at every level, um, local, state, tribal, federal, all matter. And the people that are serving us as public servants are trying to do a good job and the elected officials that um, that we ask to represent us can either support those public servants in the work they do or undermine their work. And that is really important. So elections matter, public servants matter, um, thoughtful regulation really matters. And we as citizens in this democracy all have a role to play in making sure that our voice is heard. That's great advice, thank you. Well, here's my last question for you. You've lived and worked all over this country. And as you mentioned earlier, the Pacific Northwest has been a special part of that journey for you. In your experience, what makes our region so special? I was fortunate to immigrate here, migrate, when I was three years old. And I got a taste very, very quickly uh, as a new immigrant of what people do here, and it all revolved around the outdoors. That shaped who I am, and I've seen the changes in our landscape over my 64-year lifespan. I've seen a lot of the big trees that we took for granted go away that I used to hold hands with my 20 friends just to encircle. Those are trees that we took for granted um, that are now gone forever, but the places where they remain are, are things that we need to protect. Um, we are an area that rolls up our sleeves to get things done. I, I use the Mountains to Sound Greenway as an example, um, and it is a great example of people working together to say, we wanna have a strong economy, but we also want to have a sustainable environment. That's why people move to the Northwest. How do we do that? So I'm gonna end with a couple of examples. One, the University of Washington and a program I'm involved with called Earth Lab, which says we've got some big environmental challenges. How do we address them? And how do we work with the community to do that? And so Things like uh, the Washington Ocean Acidification Center, which is part of Earth Lab, working with shellfish growers on how to handle ocean acidification and how to become part of the solution so that that industry can continue. Or the Climate Impacts Group, working with the state of Washington on reducing the risk to climate change on toxic waste sites within the state of Washington and mitigating risk. Or little grants like helping food trucks understand how they can manage their waste so it doesn't pollute um, the downstream waterways if they were to dump the, the material um, from their cooking um, into those, those local streams. So we're a place that rolls our sleeves up and gets things done. So I also want to thank the zoo for being here since I was a child, uh, for evolving the way that animals are displayed and interpreted, and most importantly, for putting conservation on the radar um, in the many visits that I'm now doing to the zoo with my grandchildren. 
so that they can see how they fit into a broader landscape and they can understand what's at risk, not just here, but around the world. So we live in a pretty special place and um, I'm glad to be back in this Washington. We really do live in a special place and I can't thank you enough for being here. It has been such an honor to have you join us, Secretary Jewell. Thank you. Thanks very much. Have a great rest of the session. Thank you. Before we meet our panel, let's pull up the results of the live poll. We ask you, when you think about the Pacific Northwest, what's the pressure on our ecosystem that worries you most? And here's how you responded. It looks like 76% of you had the same feeling as Secretary Jewell that the climate crisis is our biggest threat, but the health of our water and wildfires and threats to endangered species are also incredibly important. So thanks for participating. Like last week, we're gonna revisit this question later in the episode. Let's now meet our panel. Thanks for being here. This is Mr. Jay Julius, Chairman and uh, Council Member of Lummi Nation and President of the new Indigenous-led nonprofit, Cecila. Detective Wendy Willett with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife Law Enforcement Program. And Dr. Robert Long, Senior Conservation Scientist and Director of the Living Northwest Program at Woodland Park Zoo. Welcome, thanks for being here. So, Mr. Julius, you recently founded an organization called Cecila, and I understand that means grandmother. Can you tell us about your grandmother and the influence she had on this new nonprofit? Absolutely. So it is our way, uh, first of all, shout out to Secretary Jewell and her uh, as our trustee and working over there. Um, really appreciate her hard work on our sacred lands and waters. She uh, fought hard and thankful for that. Um, and grandmothers are our givers of life. Our mothers are our givers of life. And uh, our great grandmothers, you can see my grandmother there on the screen. Um, her mother was born in 1888, died when I was five and, in 1980. And uh, um, it just, they, they teach us um, life. They teach us how to live, basic common sense principles and uh, discipline, but the indigenous teachings as well, how to respect the land and, and uh, respect the waters and be good stewards. Well, thank you. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more from you in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Dr. Long, thanks for being here. I understand that you had um, an interesting experience with some bears, and I know you, you spend a lot of time doing conservation work out in the field, and then when you're not in the field, you uh, go outside for fun. And so can you tell us what happened on this particular camping trip? Yeah, thanks, Farah. Um, it's great to be here, by the way. And um, I think many of us have some, you know, our most powerful experiences in nature, and that definitely was the case. I had been studying carnivores for for a decade or so, but mostly in the, the, the uh, lower 48 where there were mostly black bears and those were places that I had, I had worked. But um, it was our first visit, my wife and I, who's also a wildlife researcher, we were visiting Denali National Park for the first time. And um, it was our first time camping and being around grizzly bears, which is always a new thing for people when they're not experienced with that. And we've been watching grizzly bears um, all day um, hunting ground squirrels in the, in the lower lands. And then we were camping that night after just having done this and, and a windstorm came up and absolutely blew our tent over. So here we were in the middle of the dark having just watched grizzlies and uh, we had gotten more comfortable with them, but it was, it was night. We were pretty spooked, but the northern lights were out and it was just an amazing experience that we'll never forget. And really the grizzlies were not a problem. We, we hiked <laughs> with them the rest of the trip and it was, it was an amazing experience. It sounds like it. Thanks for sharing that with us. Detective Willette, thanks for being here. Um, just like your co-panelist, I hear that the environment and nature played a really big role in your childhood as well. Yes, it did, and thank you for having me. Uh, I am born and raised in Western Washington, and I've spent my, my whole life and career here in this wonderful state. Uh, my father raised me to really have a deep appreciation for our state, for our resources, and uh, I had the opportunity to, to travel around the state with him. Uh, we, we would fish out of Nia Bay for salmon and rockfish and go elk hunting out in Cleelum and then deer hunting over in Republic. So uh, he really kind of, from a very young age, instilled in me that, that deep respect for our resources and for nature. And when I was maybe about 10 years old or so, I uh, came up with this idea for our little neighborhood group of friends called the Top Notch Club. And you know, we weren't organized like campfire or scouts or anything, but we would have like these little merit achievements, you know, things like picking up garbage and these little sort of environmental tasks that we would do. And 
it, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. But I, I've always felt, you know, really called to do something to protect the environment. I love that. The Top Notch Club is adorable. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Long, I'd like to start with you. Your expertise is in conservation in the Pacific Northwest. And over the past several months, we've seen a lot of changes to human behavior. As a result of that, have you seen any changes in um, animal behavior or animal, animal habitats, either related to this pandemic or unrelated? Yeah, um, the COVID restrictions and the stay-at-home mandates have definitely changed human behavior. And we know that wildlife behavior is strongly linked to human behavior. Um, it's really difficult to document changes at, largest, at the largest scales and how wildlife are responding. So we're involved in some studies now that will look at um, data before, during, and after the stay-at-home order. So we'll know a lot more, I think, in a year or two. But um, clearly, um, there have been some shifts in wildlife, and we've been seeing it in, in different studies. In, in the positive sense, so there are fewer cars on the road, so there have been documentation of fewer um, wildlife mortalities from cars and vehicles. So that's a positive thing. Animals are able to cross the road a little easier. In the negative sense, um, animals that maybe are more used to being around humans and dependent on human foods, or people being out in public, um, refuse containers, things like that from restaurants, they may be having a harder time finding the, the food they're looking for in those urban or suburban environments. So you might be seeing them more. And then also just, I think there are more people using the trails um, and being out in nature, and that's a good thing. But it also probably is uh, slightly confusing to some of the animals that are used to having the trails to themselves most of the time. So I think there are a lot of different ways, and we'll be, we'll be studying that and learning a lot more in the future. Great point. And one of the animals that have started to make a return on their own to the Pacific Northwest is the wolverine. Can you tell us why the wolverine is such a good sign? Sure. Um, well, wolverines are a large um, species of weasel, basically, and they live in um, high mountains here in the, the lower 48 of the United States. Um, they were gone from Washington. They were completely trapped out um, by the early 1900s. And they have recovered, or they are in the process of recovering on their own. We've been studying this recovery for the past 10 years at the zoo. And um, the reason they've recovered or, and are in the process of recovering is because of the large, protected, generally well-protected land base we have here, the public lands, the conservation lands, um, that have provided them the space they need. Wolverines need tremendous areas. One of, the, one of the animals that was studied in the Cascades used an area the size of Rhode Island, and that's over just a month or two. So they need these large areas. Um, as Secretary Jewell pointed out, it was a great point that con connections between these large areas is really important because um, these animals need more than just the wildernesses here. They need to be able to move between those, those large blocks of habitat. And so connections, or we call them habitat linkages or, or uh, corridors, um, are very important for most species. And that's, that's becoming more so with climate change. Wolverines also need snowpack. They den in, in deep snow. So climate change, as you might guess, is going to affect that as well. But it's a really great sign that they're recovering here. And we just need to continue to make sure that those connections are there and those habitats are protected. Thanks, Robert. We're posting some links in the live chat if you'd like to learn more about wolverines or some of the work that's happening here in the Pacific Northwest. Mr. Julius, um, as we're talking about conservation, some people have the opinion that conservation takes a really long time. And I know that you have a little bit of a different perspective on that um, and some of the urgency around it. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, for, for us, uh, we're six generations into this new way of living. Uh, we entered into a treaty in 1855. Our people, the Lactamish people, we ceded the islands. And in those, so if we look at it from that perspective and we draw a diagram, a, a chart across and put it in decades, and you do 16 decades, and you look at the destruction that we've done over time, it didn't take that long. So conservation, I, I think uh, there's a perception that it has to take a long time. Um, but it, in, it, when we look at the history and where we're at today and the realities we live with today and, and the conditions of whether it's the streams, the rivers, the salmon, the orcas, um, we can collapse those time frames and go the other direction, but it's gonna take, um, you know, it's gonna take will and it's gonna take a willingness and, uh, um, accepting change. So I don't think 
personally, I, I know it's a, a stretch, but um, conservation, I believe, and, and creating that change, first of all, starts with uh, making the decision to, and, and then uh, collapsing the time frames, just as we have done over the last 16 decades to get to where we are today. Thank you, it's a great point. And, and what we're talking about is, um, you know, in order to save species, we have to take responsibility for the fact that we're responsible for the damage that's been done. And in order to save them, we have to understand what's threatening them. And so next we're gonna talk a little bit about, or excuse me, next week, we're gonna talk a little bit about this pandemic. And so this week, I'd like to ask about some of the other threats to animals in our region and around the world. And so Detective Willette, um, you've done work all over the state and all over this region combating wildlife trafficking. Can you talk about some of the threats that are faced here regionally? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I've had the uh, experience to work a number of different types of trafficking cases here in the state. Um, specific to this state, I mean, it really runs the gamut of almost every resource we have. Certainly venison, big game meats get trafficked regularly, sturgeon, rainbow trout, um, salmon, sea cucumbers, you name it. And I've probably worked an investigation involving that particular animal. Uh, but recently, of course, we've taken on a new responsibility here in Washington State to also enforce the unlawful trafficking of species that aren't native to Washington, like elephants and pangolins, rhinoceros, big cats, sea turtles, uh, and some of our sharks and rays, which has been a fascinating opportunity to learn about these in different animals from different places around the world and to understand the threats that they're facing. Thank you. And we're going to come back to you in a few minutes to hear more about your wildlife trafficking work. Dr. Long, uh, Long talking about threats, um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago here in Seattle, we had dangerously unhealthy air quality and other parts of Washington state had, state had devastating wildfires. Can you talk about some of the catastrophic threat that wildfires pose? Yeah, um, wildfires are unique in that they're a natural phenomenon and, and fire is a natural part of our, our systems. But wildfires have gotten uh, more intense and hotter um, as um, fire suppression has, has caused fuels to build up and also climate change is now creating conditions that create these hotter, larger mega fires. And um, they're incredibly destructive. They're, they're horrible for people to live through and for people who live close to them. And for wildlife, um, certainly they displace wildlife. Um, but I think the bigger issue with these megafires is that they consume and, and completely destroy wildlife habitat. And there are some species, like Canada lynx, for example, um, that Secretary Jewell mentioned, but sage grouse on the drier uh, sage side of the, of the cascades, um, pygmy rabbits. These animals have very little habitat left to start with. And so these megafires have really decimated large amounts of the existing habitat. And that is going to cause problems for those species for decades until those habitats can restore because they've been burned so badly, it takes much longer to restore to a usable landscape for those species and for many other species as well. So I think the, the biggest threat is, is that it's the large habitat destruction and the way that we can try to deal with that is making sure that we have large areas for these species um, ahead of time. Um, and the connections between them so that animals, if part of their habitat is destroyed, they have the ability to move and shift and, and still persist on the landscape. So I do think um, it's, it's gotten very bad, but I think with some foresight, hopefully we can get ahead of this and conservation of landscapes and connectivity linkages is the way to really make sure that we're set up for future fires. Thanks, Robert. Mr. Julius. Um, we, you know, we've heard about fires and we've heard about trafficking and earlier we heard Secretary Jewell talking about the climate crisis and I'm hoping you can talk about the climate crisis a little bit more as a threat. Yeah, from, from my perspective and our perspective as uh, ones who have been here since time immemorial, um, we have witnessed and all of us have witnessed catastrophic disruption take place and oftentimes it's hard for us to see it today right now because of our day-to-day -day lives, uh, what is normal to us, but we have to take a walk back in time 16 decades ago and what was this? And, and, we, we, um, and, and we have to have, I know we'll talk about this in a little bit about nature, but um, what has taken place? 
what were the rivers like in 1855, 1800? Uh, some of the settlers um, who came here early on say you could walk across the backs of salmon on every single river. The streams were filled, crystal clear, pure. The mountains were covered with monstrous cedars and trees. The air was so crisp. It was an Eden, many of them said, a place of beauty, a place of perfection. And that was 16 decades ago. And really for myself, climate change is much more than just the words climate change. It's not a political thing. It's not a red or blue. It, climate anxiety in youth is real. We wanna learn something about climate change. Let's ask a child what climate anxiety is because it's a real thing. And it's something that us at our age or our elders and grandparents now today are not gonna have to reap or suffer the consequences as heavily as the up and coming youth who are our future leaders, who are the future. And, and in our way and in our belief, it's we should at least leave this place and be good stewards and leave it for the next generation as good as we got it. And we have failed terribly as, as far as that goes. And um, so climate change is broad from my perspective, but I think it's common sense. I think a youth can talk about climate change when they see yesterday and they see where we're at today. Um, it's pretty simple. And, uh, and then most important coming up with those solutions, like Secretary Jewell said, is uh, the policies that got us to where we are are, are gonna take us down a darker road and we're gonna continue this process um, of destruction. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's new policies, it's new thinking, it's common sense thinking, and, and uh, um, you know, we're gonna have to come together. And so I think it's an important question for youth too. They have great answers and perspectives on climate change. Thanks, Jay. And we're definitely gonna be talking about solutions a little bit later in the hour. Um, I know that talking about all of these threats can be a little heavy, so I'd like to lift everyone's spirits for a minute and welcome a special guest. Here with us in the studio is Rachel Salant, Curator of Behavioral Husbandry and Ambassador Animals at Woodland Park Zoo. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us today. Who do you have here? I want to introduce Skyana. Skyana is our six-year-old North American porcupine. She was born right at Woodland Park Zoo, so her mom Molly, who you can still see here in the Northern Trail. Well, Skyana's adorable. When people meet her, what do they love most about her? I think people are surprised at Yeah, and, and people like you, hopefully. Yeah. You know, you've heard our studio uh, panel talking today about the species and the spaces of the Pacific Northwest. Why did you choose Skyana to help us have that conversation? Skyana is a North American porcupine. They are native to the area. You actually uh, really can't find porcupines in the city of Seattle, though. It's a great example of a species that really needs trees in order to live, and we just don't have a whole lot of trees in the city. Um, another reason I brought her, though, is Skyana is uh, great ambassador for but she's super comfortable in this environment. And so no matter what we were talking about, I would have brought Sky on today because she's so comfortable in this environment. And what can you tell us about her? Like what would you want people who are watching today to know about this beautiful animal and her species? I think uh, people really need to understand that every animal, whether it's Skyana or her mother Molly or any animal is an individual, just like you and I and everybody watching at home. She's an individual with uh, her own personality and her own Well, thank you so much for bringing her into the studio for this, this fun little break, and I hope to see you next week with another special guest. Take care. So I hope you all enjoyed our, our prickliest guest of the afternoon, and we're going to now bring it back into the studio, um, and my next question is for Detective Willett. So I'd like to move back to you and return briefly to our conversation about wildlife trafficking. About a year ago, the state of Washington had its first prosecution of a case under its Anti-Trafficking Act. I understand that you worked as a detective in that investigation. Can you tell us about it? Yes. Um, in late 2017, one of our other detectives was scouring the internet, uh, searching through online marketplaces. 
and he discovered an advertisement for someone selling what are called netsuke. Netsuke are a, uh, uh, an adornment that's traditionally worn on a uh, gentleman's kimono. It's, it's worn over the belt and it's sort of a counterweight to a purse. And they're often made out of ivory, not always, but often, and they're very collectible. So while the advertisement didn't specify that this was ivory Netsuke that he had for sale, uh, the seller did say that he had multiple pieces and was happy to show these pieces to an interested person uh, through appointment only. So uh, I contacted the seller, posing as that interested party, and I went to his home, and inside his home, nearly every surface in the living room, in the dining room, in the kitchen area was covered in ivory and pieces for sale. It was chess sets and puzzle balls and carved tusks and netskes and I mean everything you could think of. And uh, so I, I sort of glanced through the whole collection and uh, you know asked some questions and what we learned during that was this person's techniques for how he was able to circumvent the policies that many of these online marketplaces have to prohibit the sale of ivory, uh, such as using keywords like bone instead of ivory. Uh, he knew very much uh, how to keep ivory safe, how to keep it humid, and how to store it safely. And he sort of bragged about how many pieces he had sold from the collection already. So we knew that this was you know, a large scale problem for this individual. Uh, so I, I purchased three Netsuke for about $300 and went back to my office and typed up a search warrant. And then our detectives and officers served that search warrant. And I think we seized somewhere in the vicinity of 1,300 pieces, individual pieces of ivory from that particular home. Uh, we were able to do additional search warrants on Craigslist and eBay and other online marketplaces uh, for this person's activity and discovered that he had in fact sold several pieces throughout the country. So he's now not only violated Washington State's anti-trafficking law, but also U.S. Fish and Wildlife's trafficking laws. So uh, he ended up pleading guilty to one count. He received a $10,000 fine, 15 days in jail, and 30 days home confinement. Well, and that's a really interesting case. We're actually going to hear a little bit more about it next week. Um, but as we're talking about ivory, there's probably a lot of folks that are watching and thinking, well, like I live in Washington. I have nothing to do with ivory. Um, but we also know that there's probably a lot of folks um, that care about animals and they're watching this because they're invested in wildlife and conservation. And maybe they've got items in their home um, that they've kind of come about unexpectedly. Maybe they bought a souvenir and they didn't know it was an animal product or they had um, a tortoiseshell comb passed down as a family heirloom from a relative. What advice would you have for those folks who don't want these products, but they don't know how to get rid of them safely or um, properly? Sure, and the law is very restrictive. I, I want to be very clear that you, know, you can't even give these items away to a friend or someone that wants to, to take it from you. You can inherit it to someone uh, upon your passing, but the safest way would probably be, and most legal way, would be to donate it to either a, uh, an educational facility or a scientific facility, such as Woodland Park Zoo's Toss the Tusk. It's a wonderful opportunity for individuals to offload these items that they don't feel comfortable retaining. Thanks. And you, know, you shared with me something that surprised me a little bit in our conversation about trafficking. Um, it turns out that there's a familiar fish here in our region, salmon, um, that can also be trafficked. Can you tell us about that? Sure, yeah, you know, and really any commodity can, if you've got a dollar value on it, it can be exploited. And in the case of salmon, which is such a, a tightly managed species in our, our state, um, you know, every year biologists very delicately manage this fishery and, and these fisheries and set seasons uh, for our, our tribal partners and our state partners together. And we have to try to split those quotas down the middle and they're, they're very tightly accounted for. So, so all of our commercial harvests and landings are put on what are called fish receiving tickets. And when a quota is met, when we've reached the amount of fish that we can harvest, our biologists will shut those fisheries down. Now, unfortunately, the temptation exists for individuals to fail to account for that harvest, to continue to fish, so our fish buyers can continue to purchase fish and to profit from it. 
And it's very easy to uh, create fraudulent documents. It's very easy to commingle an illegal fish or you know, perhaps even an endangered species uh, of particular you know, Chinook salmon or coho salmon in our state uh, into a legal batch of salmon. And then we have to talk about the recreational side of the house too, where we've got you know, hundreds of thousands of fishers out there potentially um, you know, in, in some instances being tempted to take more than they're supposed to. And, and even if it's only one fish, if, if 100 people do that, that's, that's a lot of fish. And it has an impact, it has a huge impact. Well, the declining salmon population in the Pacific Northwest has been very high profile and in the news a lot recently. And Mr. Julius, I'm hoping that you can help us understand the history of salmon in our region and why they are so critically important to our ecosystem. Absolutely. I, like Secretary Jewell said, uh, we are connected. And uh, I, I think we have to go back to that connection. And for us, it was extremely important to include that in this agreement we entered into with this new sovereign, the United States, and uh, the sovereign, our particular tribe, who's been here since time immemorial. Um, salmon are like uh, the caretaker for, what is your porcupine's name? Skyana. Skyana. Um, <laughs> She, she encouraged uh, the audience and the viewers to see it as a, uh, it's, got a, it's got its own character. It's got its own personality. Um, we view things the same way. We view us as connected. And we look at the disconnection that has taken place, whether it's the dams, it's habitat, uh, uh, the rivers warming up, uh, where they go back home to reproduce, to renew themselves. We don't view ourselves as dying or the salmon as dying. They go through a process and they renew and they continually come back and come back and come back. Um, and that happened since time immemorial. And all of a sudden this change has taken place. It's many things that have led to this, but you look at the disruption and the catastrophic disruption that has taken place, um, the orcas, the orcas are starving. Um, our diet requires a lot of fish, um, personally, and, and it's our way of life. It's important in our ceremonies and in weekly meals. Um, there's starvation taking place because of the depletion. It uh, has really disrupted the entire ecosystem, Salish Sea, the rivers, um, and uh, you know, it, it's just a critical, before this was the apple state, it was the salmon state, and we need to get it back to the salmon state. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. We know that salmon play such a huge role in our ecosystem. And as Jay just mentioned, they're the primary food source for one of our most treasured species in this region, the orca. Here to help us tell that story is award-winning journalist and environmental reporter with the Seattle Times, Linda Mapes. Hi, Ms. Mapes, thanks for joining us. Are you there? I am so here. It's just a pleasure to be with you all to talk about nature and animals. Well, thank you for joining us. I understand that as a kid, your mother always told you to go outside and find something to do. How did that shape your interest in nature and wildlife? You know, mothers really do know best. And <laughs> what's better than going outside and finding something to do? You know, every picture of me as a kid, I've got a black eye or I'm covered with calamine lotion and poison ivy. It changed me as as a child to uh, constantly be outside other than coming in to get fed. And really, that's still the same person I am today. <laughs> well, you've been listening in, and we're talking in the studio about the Pacific Northwest and the importance of salmon. And we really can't have that discussion without talking about one of our most iconic species, and that's the orca. So can you tell us, who are the southern residents? So I want people to understand that the Southern residents are not just random black and white wildlife. The Southern residents are the orcas that are particular to here, to our home waters. There are orcas in every ocean of the world. They are the top predator everywhere they live. But the Southern residents are the resident orcas of Puget Sound. They come here in the winter time and in the fall and they come here for salmon. They come here chasing coho, and in the winter they're chasing chum. They'll even come all the way into the downtown central waters of Seattle. Downtown orcas, who else has got that? You know, these orcas, the Southern residents, they really are great antiquity. These are not 
just random individuals. These are families in the J, K, and L pods. And they have an ancient culture, one of the most stable, oldest cultures of all mammals on Earth. A very unusual culture. The young never disperse. They stay with their mothers for life. In all of biology, that's almost unheard of. Matriarchs have a very important role in the orca culture. Usually, once an animal, a female, um, is past the age of being able to reproduce, she's done. But not in orca society. This is when the female orcas just begin to come into their true leadership capacity. They lead the pods to fish. They teach in the care of the young. They feed their sons so preferentially that those sons are more likely to die if they lose their mother, even if the sons are adults. So the role of the matriarch is very, very important. The role of the family is critical in orca society. They have language. They have distinct calls that no other orca of another type in the Northeastern Pacific would mistake. So the Southern residents should be understood as primarily residents of this place and their signatures of the wildness of this place and what is so special about the Pacific Northwest, that we are still a place that can sustain wild animals from Skyanna the porcupine all the way to the ocean's top predator and the salmon, by the way, that feed porcupines and feed birds and feed salmon and feed orcas. It is all connected. And so that's who the Southern residents are. They are the orcas of Puget Sound. They have a vast foraging range all the way from Vancouver Island, all the way down past San Francisco. That's why they're called Southern residents. But the thing that's so special about them are they are the ones that swing all the way to downtown Seattle. And seeing them is one of the greatest treats. It's such a delight. Um, but I know that our Southern residents are in trouble and I'm hoping you can talk to us about the danger that they face. Yeah, I, I won't sugarcoat this. So there are only 74 left in the Southern resident pods altogether. And that's the lowest number since the capture era, a time in our state that ended in 1976 when anybody who wanted to could just go buy an orca um, and put it on display. You know, they, they have been um, struggling to recover from that time. And, and a very good way to understand what's going on with the Southern residents is to look at their relations to the North, the Northern resident orcas, the very same animal. They also eat only salmon, but the Northern residents have been increasing steadily in population for the last 40 years. There are more than 300 of them, including lots and lots of babies. Meanwhile, our resident pods, the southern residents, are struggling to reproduce. Their numbers have, have barely grown over the last 40 years, and they keep crashing. Every time they start to rebuild in numbers, they decline once again. They've been listed as an endangered species since 2005. So what's going on? Well, scientists have identified three main threats. One is lack of adequate, regularly available Chinook salmon. Why Chinook? Because it's the biggest salmon in the sea. And these orcas co-evolved with Chinook salmon because it's a fish that's available year round somewhere in their foraging range. People often say to me, well, they just need to find something else to eat. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not how it is with orca society. Everywhere in the world, orcas specialize in what they eat. You are what you eat if you are an orca. For the transient orcas, they eat marine mammals, seals. If you're an orca off the coast of Patagonia, you snatch baby sea lions right off the beach. There are orca whales that specialize in ripping the livers out of great white sharks. So for the Southern residents, it's all about salmon, specifically Chinook, and they don't have enough Chinook. That's the first main threat they face. Secondly, pollution. Pollution finds its way into the food chain. So when they eat that fish, unfortunately, sadly, they're also taking up the pollution that's in that fish and that makes its way into the fat in their bodies. Sadly, the young, the babies, when they take that first drink of their mother's very fat rich milk, they are taking in those pollutants. So food, lack of Chinook, pollution, and then 
noise, disturbance from boats and vessels. Orcas use sound to hunt. They have a miraculous ability called echolocation. They need to hear tiny little sounds like the ping back of their echolocation being off of their, off of their head to a fish. If the water is noisy, they can't hunt well. Well, you mentioned um, a couple of minutes ago about the, um, the challenges in reproducing in our population. And it sounds like recently we did have some hope and some good news. And I'm hoping you can tell us about those signs that you're seeing. You know, it doesn't get better than two new babies in less than a month. So yeah. Mother Orca Telequa, who broke everyone's heart when she lost her calf in 2018, she's had a new baby. That baby was born September 4th and is doing great. And there's also a second new baby just a few days after that one, and even a third new baby born in the early days of um, January 2019. So that's three new babies uh, since January 2019. That's nothing but good news. And, you know, everyone in the region can think of themselves as godparents to these little baby orcas. Try to do what we can do to help these calves live and bring more. That is amazing news. Thanks, Linda. My last question for you is about this pandemic and any impacts you've observed on our southern resident orcas. What are you seeing and what can we do to help? Too much noise in the water. Too many people off in their sport boats. You know, when people couldn't go off on the vacation they were planning, a lot of people decided to get an RV or a boat. And so uh, people I know who live in the San Juan Islands uh, say they've seen more boats this summer than at any other time and uh, normally quiet coves just too noisy, too much racket, too much going on. So the thing to do is leave space for these animals. We've got uh, pregnant mother orcas still out there. We have lactating mothers with new calves. They need their space, they need their quiet. That's what we can do for them. Well, Linda, thank you so much for being here with us. For those who wanna read more from Ms. Mapes about the Southern resident orcas, we're posting some links to recent Seattle Times articles in the live chat function. Linda also has a new book coming out called Orca, Shared Waters, Shared Home. So be sure to check that out. Linda, thank you again for joining us. It's a pleasure, thank you. Well, we just heard from Linda Mapes about the threats and hope for the orcas. And here to share more about what's being done to protect our marine life is Seattle Aquarium's Ocean Policy Manager, Nora Nickham. I'm Nora Nickham, Ocean Policy Manager at the Seattle Aquarium, where we're advocating for science-based policies to protect and restore our ocean. We all love the southern resident orcas, and as an animal at the top of the food chain, they also show us the health of the Salish Sea. If they can thrive, other wildlife and ecosystems can thrive, and so can we. So we're pushing for policies that will help these critically endangered orcas and the salmon they rely upon to thrive. We need to protect and restore salmon habitats so they have enough food to eat. We need to reduce toxic pollution going into our waterways so the orcas can be healthy and have successful pregnancies. And we need to quiet the waters because orcas rely on sound or echolocation to find the scarce food. Right now, there are so many reports of boats getting too close to the orcas here in the Puget Sound when they've been here over the last few weeks and months, violating state law. Noisy boats are a particularly big problem interfering with echolocation, but even quiet boats and boats without motors can disturb the orcas foraging. All boaters should follow the Be Whale Wise guidelines at a minimum. But right now, there's something you can do, whether you're a boater, kayaker, paddleboarder, or just someone who cares, to help the orcas even more, which is to take a pledge to give the orcas more space and to spread the word. The Seattle Aquarium has joined with NGO partners and scientists to ask commercial whale watching companies to take a similar pledge and focus their tours on other species. You can go to our website at seattleaquarium.org and our blog to find more information and a link to the pledges. We hope you will join us in taking this pledge, which is an important next step in giving these orcas a chance at recovery and protecting the new orca calf and hopefully many more orca calves to come. Thanks, Nora. To learn more about Seattle Aquarium and the boat pledge to help protect our southern resident orcas, check out the resource links we're posting in the live chat. Our next guest has spent his share of time around oceans and on land. Philippe Cousteau is founder of Earth Echo International, He's a conservationist, environmentalist, filmmaker, and explorer. Mr. Cousteau, thanks for joining us. Can you hear me? I can. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for, uh, for letting me join you for a little bit. Let me see uh, if I've got the camera started up here. There yeah, we, we can see you. Great. Terrific. Well, I understand well, you had a book published last week, and you're creating a conservation legacy with Earth Echo International. But you're also carrying on a special legacy. 
Can you tell us about who or what inspired you? Well, growing up, uh, my grandfather was Jacques Cousteau, who was a, a famous filmmaker and explorer, and uh, you know, 76 years ago, in co-invented scuba diving, and was uh, was really the one responsible, along with an engineer named Emile Gagnon, to allowing humanity to explore the ocean freely, to swim like a fish, because you know, prior to that, most people have forgotten, but you know, you'd you'd wear a big hard helmet, copper helmet, and clomp around on the bottom. Uh, with big lead boots and a hose connecting you to the surface on a boat. That's really how people would explore the ocean at the time. There were very few, uh, if any, films, photographs of, of what existed beneath the waves. All we really knew about the ocean was what we dumped in in trash and what we pulled out in um, in in food. And so growing up with my grandfather, I see a little picture here. I think I'm around five or six years old here. Um, we uh, uh, he had a big influence on me and uh, sharing that legacy of of his work and um, and inspired me to continue that spirit of conservation going forward, particularly with a focus on youth and education. Well, I'm sure that you and your grandfather have inspired a lot of folks that are watching today. Um, as you've heard, we've been talking about the Pacific Northwest, and I understand you've spent some time exploring this area and our wildlife. Can you tell us about that experience? I have to say that the Pacific Northwest is is one of my favorite places, not just in the United States, but in the world. It's such an extraordinary ecosystem, uh, both above and below the water. I've had the, the good fortune to be able to go out and spend time with the J-Pod out in San Juan Islands um, that Linda was talking about earlier. And I've had an opportunity to uh, to also, also visit through Earth Echo, the nonprofit that I work with, with um, the Squamish tribe. Uh, and see some of the work that they're doing, looking at how to to pass on some of the the, the knowledge and, and the importance of salmon in their culture to a new generation, and um, and tell that story for young people around the country and around the world, uh, the importance of that kind of native knowledge and that 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 intrinsic value that um, that uh, positive and renewable relationship with the environment can provide for culture. So it was a, it was a real uh, privilege to to do that as well. Thanks for sharing that with us. As we're talking about regional health, we're talking about animals and human and water and habitats and air and ecosystems. Um, can you talk to us about how regional health, like here in the Northwest, and global health are connected? Well, it's it's something that's um, uh, you know we're, everything is connected, and that is one of the issues that we try and help people understand. Um, you know, we are all connected, and particularly the ocean. There was a recent survey. Um, by Pew Charitable Trust that um, asked world leaders uh, from all over uh, to rank critical issues uh, that's facing them and, and the world. And they they consistently listed the ocean at the bottom of the list. Um, and, I, and I believe that's one of the problems that we face is that whether it's in the Pacific Northwest or whether it's in Africa or, or Latin America or, or Asia, um, people are forgetting that the impacts in local communities impact us everywhere. Um, and that the oceans are all connected. And so, for example, what's happening up in uh, in the Pacific Northwest with a very important economically uh, in economically important industry, oyster. I mean, people are familiar. Many of you are, or your, your viewers are familiar with the issues around ocean acidification there, and the consequences of the the increasing acidity off the coastline and to the oyster fishery that is there, and the oyster aquaculture industry that is there. Uh, and in fact, it was. Um, um, the, the, the concerns around that several years ago that helped uh, that reached Washington, D.C. through the elected representatives in Washington state to raise the alarm about ocean acidification um, because that has a knockoff effects through you know, industry and, and to jobs, not just around the state of, uh, of Washington, but throughout the country where um, that seafood is imported to restaurants that employ people that work in those restaurants that transport that food. Um, so, you know, it has national significance. That's just one example. So salmon, of course, that has been dominated the, the discussion, and rightfully so, um, is another great example um, that, that has impact throughout the United States and, and indeed throughout the world. Um, so we, we have to remember that we are, you know, we don't live in silos. We're all connected and, and our actions in one place certainly do have an impact uh, uh, elsewhere. Thanks for that. Well, you know, my first question for you was about creating a legacy. Um, and so this is my last question for everyone who's watching today and they want to leave their own legacy of changing the world. What would you say to them? Well, our focus um, is on education through my nonprofit Earth Echo, through the books that I do, for example, The Endangers that came out last week, um, really in inspiring young people. And I think that's key. Uh, we have to build the kind of social and cultural foundation in this country and around the world for politicians of all stripes 
of all political parties for businesses to embrace um, sustainability and the environment. It's the choices that we make as people, as you've heard, that, that there's a lot of bad news out there. But the good news that you've heard from these outstanding panelists, uh, from everybody that's, that's joined you, I, I believe, is that we are not helpless victims. We can actually make choices consistent with the kind of world that we wanna that we want to live in for the food that we eat uh, and how much of it that we eat through supporting uh, through you know spending less time maybe in noisy boats on the water to respecting these animals and to their to their place to working towards the reduction to the restoration of our rivers and the reduction of pollution like all of us have a role to play and all of us have power through the choices we make and so that's really the message that we try and share and particularly with a focus on education my grandfather always said before we can talk about conservation we have to talk about education and we're big believers in that we're big believers that young people are not just the leaders of tomorrow but the ones that are driving those trends today and i know um, that the that the zoo uh, the seattle aquarium which we work with a lot um, are, are at the forefront of that and recognizing that that there's a lot of hope there's a lot of good things that are happening out there and there's a lot of good people that want to make positive change a lot of particularly young people People that want to make positive change and i think embracing that empowering that and providing a platform and lifting that up is absolutely critical again to creating that kind of cultural and social shift in society where we value sustainability with nature more than you know short-term profits or the convenience of using single-use plastics and throwing them away so true well philippe thank you so much for joining us and for being here congratulations on your new book the endangered for anyone who well, wants thank to you learn. for having me. This has been such a wonderful uh, gathering, uh, and, and I'm really feel really fortunate uh, to be among such uh, esteemed guests and, and to be a part of this. So I, I really am grateful. Thank you. Well, and it's not done yet. For anyone who wants to learn more about Earth Echo International and Mr. Cousteau's work, we're posting some links in the live chat. We've heard a bit today about the connectedness of our region to the rest of the world, and I hope you hang in there with us a few more minutes because here to help us build on that discussion is Dr. Lisa Zabeck, Senior Conservation Scientist and Director of the Papua New Guinea, excuse me, Papua New Guinea Tree Kangaroo Conservation Program at Woodland Park Zoo. Hi, Dr. Zabeck, thanks for joining us. Hi. Well, we're thanks. gonna hear a little bit about your work in a moment, but first, I understand that our last guest's grandfather, Jacques Cousteau, had quite an influence on you. Yes, he did. I grew up on the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau, and I'm known for tree kangaroos and Papua New Guinea, but I actually started out as a marine biologist and studied the feeding behavior of humpback whales. So this discussion about orcas and salmon is really dear to my heart. Well, thanks, Lisa. Um, you've heard us as we're talking about regional health in the Pacific Northwest, and you just mentioned your work in Papua New Guinea. How would you describe that the way um, our region is tied to the health of places on the other side of the ocean or the other side of the world? Yeah, and I think many of our speakers have been talking about the connectedness, but we know that in um, the Pacific Northwest, we are part of the Pacific Rim. So we are connected with all of our Pacific nations that are um, along the Pacific Ocean. And so that means that anything that happens in the Pacific Ocean affects all of us, all of those nations that are part of the Pacific Rim, which includes Papua New Guinea. And so we see it with plastics in the ocean. And so we can talk about the health of salmon in Washington and Alaska, in Russia, and it's all impacted by the health of the ocean. So we are all connected, even all the way into Papua New Guinea. And then also the way we approach conservation and trying to create a sustainable living landscape. We talked about it a lot for the Pacific Northwest, but it is the very same for where I work in Papua New Guinea and for the communities in Papua New Guinea. They're getting the tools to work on adapting to climate change, to um, creating a sustainable landscape and create sustainable resources for their children as well. So in that way, we're all connected. Well, and speaking of communities in Papua New Guinea, I understand that last year you organized an exchange between their community members and members of Lummi Nation, including Mr. Julius, who's here next to me in the studio. Can you tell us a little about that exchange? Absolutely. Hi, J Jay. It's really nice to see you. <laughs> um, last July in 2019, we were very fortunate and it was one of the most incredible experiences. 
um, six representatives from Papua New Guinea were invited by the Lummi Nation to spend five days up on the, um, the Lummi um, Nation as part of the annual Salish canoe journey. And this was an opportunity for the Papua New Guinea group and the Lummi Nation to be able to discuss common issues with conservation and natural resource management, and then also to share um, the diverse cultural practices and beliefs. And it was very moving because Jay and um, the former uh, cultural chief of Lummi Nation, uh, Bill James, met with our six representatives from Papua New Guinea, and they did a ceremony basically connecting the two groups together. And to me, that really represented the connectedness and how we have to work together. As a conservation biologist, one of my roles, I think, is to support and bring together indigenous groups so that they can be leaders in conservation. Thanks, Lisa. And Mr. Julius, I'd like to come back to you in the studio for a moment. You played a significant role in the exchange that Dr. Daybeck just de described. Was there anything special that stood out to you or anything that you'd like to share with us about that experience? Yeah, I just checked my arm, see if I had a scar from the bow, bow and arrow they brought from there. <laughs> it was a traditional one. And, and if they come back, I'm gonna teach them how to make bows the lummy way because I couldn't get the arrow <laughs> off the string. And that was a challenge. No. I, that, that was exciting. You know what? There were so many memorable moments in hosting them and eating fish with them and crab with them and uh, these folks dressing the traditional way, really still living uh, the traditional way, something we hunger for, uh, being connected with nature and the land and, and uh, just awesome people, awesome experience, um, just rich in culture and language. And uh, it was just... Uh, you know, just a memorable moment, and thank you, um, Doctor, for for allowing us the honor to to experience that and uh, have ceremony. I, I think in climate change solutions and worldly solutions, that's what we need. We need ceremony, and uh, it's a lot of what's we have science, but we need to tie science and ceremony together and uh, value that. And um, but. Yeah, a lot of great moments. The bow was one of the greatest. And, and then just uh, uh, breaking bread together, praying together, sharing stories together, history together, uh, what it once was, and the way they live now. Just uh, a, a great experience. Thanks for sharing yeah. that with us. Yeah. Well, Lisa, I'd like to come back to you for one last quick question. The relationship between Papua New Guinea is one that you've been cultivating over many years. Um, and it started with your work to save one particular species. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, very briefly, um, it's the tree kangaroo and it's an endangered species and we have it here at Woodland Park Zoo. In fact, right now we have a joey, which means we have a little baby um, he here at Woodland Park Zoo. And they are a very special animal, but they're also very uh, little known. And so, the work that I do in Papua New Guinea, uh, the tree kangaroo is the flagship species for the work with the communities in Papua New Guinea. But I always say that conservation is about people. And so we use these icon animals like orcas, like tree kangaroos, but it's really about the decisions that we make as humans and the behavior that we do and how we teach our children, because they are truly the future for stewardship of our planet. Thank you so much, Lisa. You do incredible work. For anyone who wants to learn more about Dr. Daybeck's work on the Tree Kangaroo Conservation Program, we're posting some links in the live chat. Before we let you go, Lisa, I know we have <laughs> uh, a conservation partner from Papua New Guinea who sent us a special message. Would you like to introduce her? Yes, I'm really honored to introduce Ms. Modi Pontio, and she is our Associate Director of the Tree Kangaroo Conservation Program in Papua New Guinea. And so she has a video um, announcement for us straight from Papua New Guinea. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Hello, my name is Modi Pontio. I work as the Associate Director for the Tree Kangaroo Conservation Program 
based in Lei Morobe province in Papua New Guinea. I am responsible for overseeing and, in, and ensuring the effectiveness of the organization. The presence of COVID-19 has affected our work quite considerably. Firstly, this year we had planned to review our review and develop a new five-year strategy. The workshop was to happen in March, and just as we were about to conduct the workshop, the travel restrictions was imposed by the government. Our two contracted staff were forced to leave the country immediately. The remote working arrangement has affected their level of support to our program. During the lockdown, our staff were required to work from home. Although we provided laptops and prepaid cards for internet, many of our staff live in areas where good internet connectivity and constant electricity is a daily challenge. The working from arrangement did not work for our team and we lost work time. Our rangers and conservation officers were asked to not conduct any patrols during the lockdown. The psychological stress resulting from travel restrictions to visit families was probably what affected staff the most. Our staff come from all over Papua New Guinea and not allowing travel can make one feel isolated from their loved ones. We understand that we have to adjust to the new measures as this is going to be the new normal going forward. We are thankful that our job is in the community safely tucked away in the isolated mountains. But we are also mindful that because use is a very remote, is very remote and does not have basic services, controlling coronavirus if it reaches the landscape could be very difficult. And so we are we maintain vigilance in all our association with our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Modi. It's great to hear from you. Well, we're nearing the end of our program, but we do have a few things left for you. First, I'd like to return to our panel for a final question for each of them. Detective Willette, you've shared some great information with us today about wildlife trafficking. For anyone watching and thinking, well, I'm not trafficking animal <coughs> products, why should I care? What would you say to them? I would say that wildlife trafficking is a global crisis, and I think it demands a global response. And I think it is our responsibility as citizens of this planet to care. And if you love animals, then, then you should want them to have a long and happy, healthy life. Uh, what we need to understand is that these are often, you know, vast criminal networks that are sometimes generating $20 billion in illegal money every year from this industry. They're exploiting individuals who sometimes don't have a place to turn for legal employment to get them to poach the animal. They're further exploiting the, the transportation networks to get that animal and its parts from where it was killed to the end market. So as an end user, it's very important that if you decide to purchase meat, seafood, fish, artwork, medicine, any, any of these items that could be made from animal products that you know exactly where it came from and that it was lawfully and ethically harvested. Thanks, Wendy. Dr. Long, we heard about communities in Papua New Guinea, so let's talk about communities in the Pacific Northwest for a moment. What's something folks here can do to get involved? Well, I think what, one thing we've heard from all our amazing guests is how diverse this, this region is. People think of the Serengeti or the Amazon, but the Pacific Northwest is truly a special place from the dry, um, eastern side to the Cascades to Puget Sound. Um, there's no place like it in the world. So I think um, exploring it quietly, um, as we heard, <laughs> is the best way to really get connected. Um, learn as much as you can about it and share it with the people you know and the people you love. Um, I think there are also more direct opportunities with formal community science or community citizen science type um, efforts. We launched one last year um, through the zoo and Seattle University called Carnivore Spotter. So you can go online. If you live in the greater Seattle area, if you see um, a carnivore, a coyote, a bobcat, a raccoon, you can actually go online and, and submit that as a report. And we're putting together these data both to better understand where animals live, how they move through our urban and suburban environments, but also just to um, encourage people to learn more about the species that they live around every day. And then I guess I would um, echo what some of the other guests have said and, and just say that um, policies and the people who enact those policies really matter. 
So um, finding out who supports conservation in your region and at the national level, making sure that you vote in the next election, those types of activities can go a long way to conservation um, at the largest scales and over the longest times. Thanks, Robert. We're gonna post a link to the carnivore spotter in the live chat. Thanks. Mr. Julius, we've talked a lot today about our role protecting nature and the environment. And so my final question for you, are we actually separate from nature? That is a great question. I think if you ask different cultures, you're gonna get different answers. Um, our, our connection to nature, no. Uh, the Lummi people, the fishermen, the people who have been in this new world, as you know it now, uh, for 16 decades, absolutely not. But uh, we must work together as one, WDFW and the tribes, the zoo and the tribes, uh, the Salish Sea, the rivers, the salmon, the orcas, we all must come together and work together. But I think that, in, that question is important because I counter that back to you. I counter it back to the audience. Was there a divorce that took place that created a superior I am greater than and we can sacrifice and drive things to extinction at the benefit of what? And the reality of where we are today, whether it's the salmon population depletion to near zero, the orcas struggle to survive, um, I, I think we have to ask ourselves that question. And are we divorced? Are we separated from nature? Um, and, and whatever that word was created, or we accepted that separation, or a culture accepted that separation, I think we witness what we witness today and what we're living through. And I think that's part of the solution for the youth as we move forward into the future, coming up with those solutions like, like we heard with the porcupine. We're one. Uh, they have a spirit. The rocks have a spirit. The rivers have a spirit. This is what grandmother says. The ocean has a spirit. Um, you know, if we think different, we should be ashamed of ourselves. We're all connected. And um, my dog was dreaming the other day. And anybody who has a dog and you see your dog dream, isn't that the funniest thing? Yeah. My lab is just moving her legs and making <laughs> noise. But, and we encourage our kids to dare to dream and dream big. What are the dreams of those who are at nearly extinction? If our dogs can dream, can orcas dream? And what was their world once before? What was it yesterday in their lifetime and what are they experiencing now? What, what stories are they telling their children? We are the voice. They are not voiceless. We have an obligation through connection and through our connection to nature, our being one, to be that voice, not only the voice, but the solution for the problems that we have created for this disconnect from nature. That was a great way to sum it all up for us. Thank you, Jay. Well, when we started today's discussion, I asked all of you a question for the live poll. And now that you've heard from our panelists and guests, we'll revisit a version of that question. So please open your live chat function and let's see how you feel. Here's the question. When you think about the Pacific Northwest, where do you feel most empowered to make a positive change? Type one, for the health of our water. Type two, for climate crisis. Type three, for wildfires. Or type four, for threats to endangered species. And while you're typing your answers, let's hear a very important final message from Woodland Park Zoo's president and CEO, Alejandro Grijal. Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in and learning more about how we can all work together to save species and habitats and sustain our environment. Last week, we examined the important roles that zoos and aquariums play in taking care of all kinds of animals. We heard from partners around the world who are working to protect animals and their habitats. This week, we bring the focus home here to our beautiful Pacific Northwest. Our region is a hub of innovation and of precious natural landscapes. From our snow-capped mountains, to our lush forest, to the unique bodies of water like the Salish Sea, each of us play a critical role in the continued health of this region. And the health of our region is tied to the health of our planet. The better we protect our home, the easier it will be to protect the homes of plants and animals everywhere. Next week's episode will show you how our health is linked to the health of plants and animals, and it's also linked to the health of the planet. For now, I want you to think of the different ways you, you can enjoy this unique natural heritage here in our Pacific Northwest, 
and the actions that you can take to protect it. Getting outside and connecting with nature is a great first step. Whether you like hiking, biking, bird watching, kayaking, or visiting the Woodland Park Zoo, you can get a better sense of the beauty and wonder of our region. It's also important that you take actions to protect our beautiful places. For example, when you're traveling, avoid buying trinkets that are made from animal parts. Recycle and compost. Avoid single-use plastics that clog waterways and harm marine life. Plant a garden in your neighborhood with plants that attract bees and pollinators. And write to your elected officials. Most importantly, if you're old enough, vote for those candidates that support a healthy planet. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you at our zoo very soon. Thanks, Dr. Grahal. Thanks for that great message. I hope all of you have enjoyed One Northwest, the species and spaces of the Pacific Northwest. I'm not going to read the poll results to you, but we'll put those up so that you can see them because the truth is there's no wrong answer. Any way that you feel empowered to help make a difference is a really great thing. Thanks to being for our uh, in-studio panelists for being here, Mr. Jay Julius, Dr. Robert Long, Detective Wendy Willette, and our in-studio visit from Ms. Rachel Salant. Special thanks to our live video guests, the Honorable Sally Jewell, Mr. Philippe Cousteau, Dr. Lisa Daybeck, and Ms. Linda Mapes. And finally, thanks to our pre-recorded guests, Dr. Alejandro Grahal, Ms. Nora Nickham, and Ms. Modi Pontio. This episode has been recorded and will be available at zoo.org forward slash one wild world if you'd like to rewatch or go back and find any of the live chat resources. And we also have uh, Common Core discussion prompts available for middle and high school students um, available on our website for anyone that wants to do a deep dive into this conversation um, after today's event wraps. Please join us next week for the final episode in this three-part series as we explore this pandemic, wildlife trafficking, and conservation in One World, How an Animal and a Human Changed Global Health. We have an amazing lineup of experts, and it'll be a great discussion. Thanks again to U.S. Fish and Wildlife for the grant support for this series, and to our partners at Seattle Lives and PNTA for bringing us to you live. Thanks for joining us today, and I hope to see you next week for One Wild World.